The Accelerated Dragon is one of the most underrated openings for black since you can genuinely just fianchero, develop these knights, castle, and then you can always break with d5, which in my opinion makes it the easiest Sicilian to learn if you find yourself anywhere below 1700. So by the end of the video you should feel very comfortable trying out the Sicilian defense or perhaps if you're already playing it, you're actually gonna have a decent idea of what you're doing. Okay, 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 managed to get another black game, gonna open it up uh, with a Sicilian and gonna be going for the accelerated uh, Dragoon. Is my opponent gonna go open? Open it is. Uh, always on open Sicilian, we have to take. You cannot really allow your opponent to, let's say, push and just uh, get a huge uh, space advantage. So we're gonna be taking as soon as the pawn lands on d4. And we see the knight, just gonna complete the fianchero and idea is to develop the knight next, gaining a tempo. Bishop e3 yet again, uh, this seems to be apparently a common weird thing that they do, so I'll pay attention to that. <laughs> However, it will generally just transpose after knight c3. If takes, happy to take towards the center, uh, preparing d5 break. And uh, if c4, I'm a huge fan of queen b6 against the Marochi. It's a very tricky sideline uh, that I think, honestly, it's perhaps uh, the only way that makes sense to play the Accelerated Dragon. I just think uh, not playing Queen b6 on the Marochi just uh, leads to very complicated games that are slightly worse. <laughs> That's the more uh, annoying part, not that it's complicated. So, <clears throat> knight to c3, I'm going to play knight f6. No need to be afraid of takes and then e5 because... You can simply play knight to g8 and then break with f6 or uh, play knight h6, castle knight f5. Many ways to get a playable position. So notice that we're constantly saving a tempo playing d6. If we play d6, it's just transposition to normal dragon. Then white goes f3, queen d2, long castle, uh, bishop h6, h4, h5, simple attack. That's what we want to avoid. Okay, when you are playing the Accelerated Dragon, castling long uh, is kind of questionable. So, uh, that's pretty nice, especially as a beginner. You don't have to worry about uh, this kind of complicated games where uh, you need to be ultra precise just to get enough kind of play, just not to get mated. So, uh, yeah, Queen 2 d 2 Notice that usually, from my experience, I feel like uh, people in this rating range don't really differentiate uh, the normal dragon from accelerated or they think it's going to be the same. I guess most people just transpose. But you have even better move than transposing. You can play d5 right away. Pretty much uh, fully taking advantage of the fact that uh, we uh, didn't rush with d6. So just in general, this is going to be my approach overall whenever we are playing the accelerated dragon. I'm gonna go uh, d5 uh, whenever I can. I just think it's the easiest and uh, it will save you uh, generally a lot of pain from studying uh, kind of uh, just enormous theoretical lines and you also get a good position. So what's not to like there? It's almost like uh, the perfect girlfriend that uh, doesn't exist. You play d5 in uh, Accelerated Dragon. So bishop to e2, kind of ignoring my stuff. Normally, um, I would expect ED, but then simply take, and that is fine. But on bishop to e2, first instinct is, okay, can we just push e5? And if the knight moves uh, away, uh, we can fork, winning a piece. Taking is probably more appropriate, but then uh, we do have a BBC. So I don't know how you guys feel about that, but the black center is going to be pretty nice. Alternatively, let's say the only other thing to consider is d, e, f, e, and then knight g4, targeting uh, the bishop. Say he goes bishop g4, bishop g4, knight c6 probably, pawn c6, queen d8, rook d8, wouldn't be shocked if he goes short castle, then maybe we can play uh, rook a b8, rook a b1. I don't know how that endgame really is. Uh, so, yeah. Going for the BBC. I think he has to take and play bishop g5, honestly. 
But just uh, having such a massive porn center, I think, should give us a pretty uh, significant advantage already. I could be wrong, though. Uh, it could get uh, pretty messy. We'll have to check it after the game. But this just feels like such a dream position, doesn't it? Like, he's not in time with the attack. We're ready to push D4. Also, in case he goes there, uh, rook b8, uh, queen b6, and then perhaps a mate on b2. Maybe bishop c5 uh, to be considered. But it's funny that in these variations, usually you just uh, tend to sacrifice the exchange. Like, I wouldn't be shocked if this can be met by d4. And if bishop f8, queen takes on f8. And let's say knight a4. One potential uh, tricky idea is, let's say we just push c5. He goes long castle, but then uh, bishop h6 wins the queen, which is pretty hilarious. Uh, and even if he doesn't uh, fall for that, uh, black has very good uh, sort of strategic positional uh, compensation uh, because uh, we're going to be dominating on the dark squares. But after ed, I think simple move is best. 95. I don't think we really need to get rid of his knight just because we could potentially take advantage of it by going for the fork. So, I'm going to do this. Here again, could keep the same idea. Definitely in this position, nothing wrong with like rook e8. I just wanted to mention that kind of typical idea that, uh, you know, it's the typical uh, spicy uh, dragon sacrifice that uh, I wanted you guys to be aware of. It's definitely very uh, well known. It's not like I'm making this thing up. So, uh, okay. Bishop h6. Interesting, as one may say. How should we play? For a second, I was looking at a pretty weird tactic, kind of uh, without a good reason. I think it's just a bad move, but uh, I kind of uh, glanced over an IG4 with the idea that after pawn takes, I have this cool idea to check and then win the bishop. But then my pawn on d5 will collapse, so that's no good. Maybe d4 right away, because... Bishop g7, king g7, uh, we exchanged the uh, dark square bishop and uh, we have placed our pawns on dark squares, meaning that, uh, let's say, we have the uh, light square bishop. It's going to be very uh, active, usually just because of this nice concept of having your pawns on the opposite color uh, of your bishop. That is pretty nice in general if you can uh, achieve it. Also not easy for him to uh, yeah, like really find the square for the knight. Mm. It's like uh, the knight needs to find uh, a hostel to stay for like one move, but uh, not, not clear really what he's going to do after. Uh, so perhaps castling is an idea just uh, so he can meet DC with queen d8 because I don't have my rooks connected, but on long castle I can already just ignore with bishop e6. Solving the issue and when the knight moves... Uh, Perhaps bishop takes on a2, could happen. But yeah, he chooses to play knight to e4 and you pause the video. Let's see if you're paying attention to uh, whatever the heck I'm saying here. Because black has a winning move. And it's pretty funny that he walked uh, straight into it. Knight takes on e4. You may be wondering, okay, Alex Barnes, yeah, but how is this a winning move? Isn't that just a trade? Well... It is a trade in the first place, but we are opening up the door for a winning move that, uh, well, if you've been paying attention to it, it's very obvious. Uh, so, we are attacking the Kavin, so he has to take. Now, after he takes, we're going to be uh, going for uh, the finisher. Okay. This is a move that's very easy to miss, just because it almost never happens. That's kind of the funny part. It's not like you move the e-pawn very often in the dragon. So that's why my opponent forgot about this check. And then we just get to pick up the bishop. Important to take like this, because if you uh, take the other way, uh, you're giving back the piece. So that's a no-no. Okay, no Gucci. Gonna do this. Uh, got the extra piece. Now uh, should just try to clean up the board. Trade all the pieces. Mm, gonna keep it very simple. He wants to perhaps castle, so I could do this move to keep his king in the middle. I think that's very annoying. Uh, question is, am I getting my bishop trapped? It kind of looks like that. Does it really matter, though? I think it does, so I'm just going to do a5 idea to play like this and trade the bishop. I'm still letting him castle, which 
comes in pretty handy, but uh, as long as we get uh, the trade, this should be pretty nice. He's gonna do queen f3, I'm gonna take, and uh, after the queen takes, we have many moves, but I'm gonna do what I believe to be the easiest. Okay, I just cannot stress this enough. Whenever you have the extra piece, I don't really care uh, how good of a player you think you are. You gotta keep it safe. So, this move makes my position slightly worse because I'm gonna have a weak pawn. But, I think it is definitely uh, worth it because it just pretty much kills every single chance of counterplay uh, my opponent had before it even started. So, uh, now... I'm looking for the for where to activate uh, my rooks, basically. I could be playing uh, rook d8 idea rook d2, um, which is obviously very strong. I could also do it with the other rook, so I can play f5 after and use the rook via f file. Anyway, should win, to be honest. I could also do, like, let's say, rook here first, provoking c3, and then rook b8. And if, uh, yeah, b3 will win the pawn, and if rook b1... I think it's just very passive. I think maybe we can just keep or something. Or rook c4 rather. Uh, okay. I want to show you guys the power of uh, infiltrating using uh, the second rank. I think that's uh, highly uh, underestimated. So I'm going to be doing it this way. Perhaps it was more efficient to use this rook. So I had the f5 option. I don't think it should uh, really matter. I'm going to go here. Targeting the pawn. He's gonna defend, but then I'm gonna go rook d8, and uh, we're gonna double up on the bubble up. <laughs> okay, are you ready to see the pigs? I think that's uh, how they call these two rooks on the second. Not only that, uh, we're gonna have uh, mating ideas, but we can literally uh, scoop up these pawns uh, one by one. They're gonna be dropping literally like a house of cards. So, uh, okay. This, because on check, I can just drop the bishop, so that is not a checkmate. Important. Uh, also, threatening uh, mating too. So with the rook on f1, that's typical mating net, so for this reason he played the uh, rook f3. Now question is, can we do something like that? I would like to activate the bishop. The thing is, uh, rook f1 is just a trade. But if we could give him a check, when that happens, we're going to be winning the rook, so... I want to do this, activating the bishop, and uh, bishop e3 is the punchline. Um, yeah, so we know how to defend. Perhaps he has to do this, but obviously I can start uh, picking up pawns. I can do whatever here and win. The conversion is rather simple, but uh, yeah, still got to watch out for uh, these things. However, he collapsed immediately. He missed uh, the point of the previous move, so uh, there we go. The, the dark square bishop, the one that, uh, you know, looked kind of passive, is going to be uh, sealing the deal after rook f1, bishop e3, going to be the final touch. My opponent sort of realizing and uh, probably kicking his computer. I don't know really though. Would you kick your computer after this game, guys? I think, uh, yeah, we were in control pretty much the whole time, so we get the game. Now, the question is... How much of an uh, accuracy do you think we'll get? Because I'm going to make a bold prediction. And I'm going to say we're going to get a 95. Plus. And I'm going to give him like a 75. Okay, do you think we can get this high? Let's go over it. Okay, we got only like a 93. How? I thought there was more. We almost uh, guessed his uh, accuracy perfectly. But I don't know. I feel like I've just played amazing the whole time. E5 just felt like such a good move. I'm just curious about the exchange sacrifice that I mentioned, whether it's actually good or complete nonsense. Am I spitting complete nonsense? Actually, you see, this is instructive. So computer just goes rook b8, uh, bishop e6 as top two lines, and rook e8 only third. So, uh, you know, I'm not, like, completely stupid. D4, yeah, this is interesting. This is very much playable. But even better if you just play rook b8, apparently, to get that pressure. 
And now there is pressure, there's a bishop incoming, there's like, if he castles queen c5, check, just dominating uh, white. He has exchange, but because there are no open files, his exchange is useless. That is usually the main thing uh, to guide yourself. Uh, let's say when uh, you're considering whether to sack the exchange or not. Try to think whether your opponent can make any use of his rooks. To better understand this concept, I'll just uh, show you a quick line uh, from the Jobava London, kind of unrelated to our video, but uh, well, let's say he plays Grunfeld, and then there is this variation where uh, white affords to completely give up uh, the rook for knight and pawn, just because this rook will never participate in the game, and uh, white has very easy play uh, to bring the rook to the h file, knight e5. So the pieces are just uh, way more useful in such situation where uh, there are no, uh, let's say, uh, open uh, files on the board. Plus, okay, also we have uh, weak king. So don't sacrifice your exchange like a madman after watching this video. Just try to be a little bit more open to it. So um, I think that's pretty much it about this game. Remember to castle, all right. You fianchero, you develop these knights. And then your castle. And after your castle, you're not playing d6, just being an average uh, dragon player. You're gonna be playing uh, the move d7, d5, just because Alex Banza told you so. With that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. All right, everybody managed to get a game uh, with the black pieces. I am gonna be playing the Sicilian and uh, we're gonna be going aggressive, despite the fact that I just got a haircut and uh, I look like a five-year-old. Okay, my argument for that would be uh, five years old. I'm pretty good at chess nowadays, so uh, I'm gonna take that as a compliment while I'm gonna be playing the Accelerated Dragon. You can call it Hyper Accelerated Dragon, it is the same thing. Essentially, the only difference uh, between the normal dragon and the accelerated one is that we're gonna be delaying this uh, d6 move uh, because we have options to play d5 later on. But you don't wanna rush with that, very important. So opponent plays open Sicilian, which I'm gonna take. They have two options, open Sicilian and uh, anti-Sicilians, meaning they're not gonna play d4. So I'm gonna take. Now he can take with the knight or with the queen. If he takes to the queen, very important to develop these knights. First this, to not hang the rook and then hit the queen. Uh, and we're gonna have that on the channel, I'm pretty sure. Gonna complete the fianchero and they usually have two main moves. Let's say two main uh, structures. They can either play this with knight c3 or with c4, the Marochi bind. Opponent starts with bishop e3, which is not the most common move order. But I'm gonna play knight c6 regardless with the idea to recapture towards the center. Expecting him to play knight c3, okay, bishop to c4. It's a little bit odd that uh, he is developing, uh, I mean, he is delaying development uh, of the b1 knight. But in the same time, I don't think we can really punish that. So I'm just gonna play knight f6. Usually you always develop like that in the accelerated dragon. And fine. By playing a pretty strange move order, we have uh, managed to get uh, one of the biggest main lines uh, possible. Where I'm gonna castle. Now, opponent is supposed to play bishop to b3. It's just, uh, you know, a very standard move. And we actually get uh, my favorite uh, way of playing this, which is not d6. Okay, you can definitely play that. That is fine, especially uh, if you don't uh, wanna be sacrificing a pawn. But I think it is just super interesting uh, to play this very new move, d5. Okay, like say maybe five years ago, this did not even exist. But nowadays, thanks to the supercomputer, uh, supercomputers, uh, it actually turns out to be a very interesting move. And I think it's really one of the best uh, ways uh, to learn this opening, especially as a beginner. Just because of the, let's say, slightly forcing nature, that just uh, simplifies the position immediately. Plus, it can teach you a lot of important uh, skills uh, along the way in your chess career. 
uh, after the main move, ed5, knight a5, we're going to be winning the bishop pair. And uh, we're going to be playing for compensation with uh, two bishops. Uh, the plan is pretty simple to just play b6, bishop b7, and uh, yeah, just keep attacking that pawn. But he goes for knight takes on d5, which is actually, I would say, a common mistake. Because they forget that the knight plays an important uh, role in uh, keeping the e4 pawn defended. So already this turns out to be a great trade for us. Just imagine he goes knight takes on c6. We can recapture with the pawn, targeting his knight. And then, once the knight moves, uh, probably we could uh, eat that pawn onto the long diagonal. So, uh, yeah, it's good that I checked this. Uh, whenever I'm preparing an opening, I have to like go over the main lines, but I also need to keep an eye on this kind of, uh, let's say, potential mistakes that uh, they can be making. You definitely don't want to be in the position where... Uh, you only check the best moves. I used to do that quite a lot when I was starting out, but you always end up uh, over the board, your opponent plays something different, and then you're just sitting there kind of questioning your existence. Uh, you're like, all right, I look this up. It shouldn't be a good move, but how the heck am I going to play? So hopefully these videos are going to help you with that problem. He captured, I'm going to do that. And knight c3 loses. Okay, that's pretty obvious, because uh, we just take with the bishop and there's a fork at the end. And kind of only move for him knight f4. Like knight b4 just looks very shady. Bishop b2 targeting the rook, while also threatening to uh, slide back. Bishop c3 with a double attack. So, probably just gonna be collecting the free pawn. And honestly, he's very close to getting checkmated in the middle of the board. I'm going to take, and then I'm just going to take, yeah. Intermediate check doesn't work, because queen goes back, so. Um, yeah, probably he'll go rook d1, the way he played this. But then, I don't know, it feels very dangerous for him still. And one idea to, like, really uh, not forget about is that can always throw in this, kind of saying that you're not going to be going anywhere, you know? We're just going to uh, literally body check our opponent saying that, uh, okay, buddy, you're just going to stay in the center for a while, okay? It's like uh, my opponent's getting pulled out by the cops and uh, we need to see his documents. I'm just going to go bishop a6. I'm going to try to ask for his ID card. But could it actually be better to check him first? And then after king e2, maybe play this move with a check. He goes to f3, and usually, uh, yeah, a lot of beginners would freak out here, kind of trying to look for the mate, you know, like, uh, let's say you see a naked girl for the first time in your life, like you don't know how to approach it, but I would say when it just looks so tempting, maybe too good to be true, Normally, that's the way it is. So I'm just going to play it simple. Bishop onto a6. Trapping my opponent's king in the middle. And if he's like, uh, I don't know, carelessly playing f3, bishop c3, he's just genuinely getting him mated without queens on the board. So he plays c4. Kind of a clever move. Uh, cutting away my bishop. In the same time, cutting his own bishop too. Now, cutting what bishop is more important? That I wasn't super sure of, but definitely an important move to have, kind of connecting your rooks. So I can just check king e2 and then maybe go back. I think I'm quite okay with that idea. I just want to sort of, uh, let's say, misplace his king a little. And then I'm just going to go with my bishop home. I think f6 is nice to kind of keep room for the king. And also now there is this idea of knight to c3. So, most likely he will have to completely give up on the file. And we already have the extra pawn, okay? Like, still, you need to understand we have a very valuable asset long term. It's not like you need to force the issue and uh, potentially pericolate the result of the game. Um, and okay, my opponent plays knight d3, simply losing awareness uh, of the fork just because of uh, how much pressure he was under since the beginning of the game, pretty much. So, uh, yeah, usually when you put pressure on your opponent, they really crack uh, pretty fast. 
So I just resigned. Uh, I was about to simply double up the rooks and uh, a sacrifice was looming uh, with a winning position. So now the question is, what do you guys uh, think the accuracy for this game really was? If I had to guess, I would probably say like a 91, 92 for us and maybe like an 80 for him. Let's check it. I mean, I was pretty close. Curious where uh, we could have done better. Yeah, I told you his move order was just a little bit strange. But uh, yeah, we enter this main line where they are supposed to go ED and then knight a5. And probably a lot of your opponents may be doing something like this to keep the pawn. Notice that uh, this, you just win back the pawn immediately, which is the point of the line. Where black is very comfortable with uh, bishop here in an open position. So they normally try to keep the pawn, but after b6, bishop b7, I think black has amazing compensation uh, with the bishop pair. It's quite easy to play. I already have uh, many games like this on my uh, main account. So on knight takes on d5, allowing knight e4. Yeah, this has been all great. Bishop a6 was uh, fine. Close to check him. Apparently bishop c3 was... Maybe slight inaccuracy, but I don't really think so. To be honest, computer just liked uh, targeting this pawn immediately with knight d6 type of move. Uh, sorry if the arrows are kind of confusing. Uh, yeah, this was a little bit better, just immediately targeting the pawn with the point that, uh, okay, we're just going to go back and uh, we have managed to open up the road for the bishop and he is stuck. Uh, just like a uh, step bro. So... I meant to say stepsister. So, <laughs> I'm going to play bishop to c3 and I'm going to go back. And after pretty much knight d3 was immediate blunder. He can play it a little bit better, but don't forget that he's still down upon at the end of the day. So, black is just uh, close to winning in my opinion. So, yeah, pretty nice and smooth win. And uh, I think with that being said, we can just move on to the following game. All right, boys and girls, getting another Sicilian game. Gonna be going for the Accelerated Dragoon. Um, almost Accelerated Raccoon, except it's uh, with a D. Uh, all right. Come on, opponent. Oh, come on. Ah, Lapin. That's how you know your opponent has no friends. I'm just gonna play D5. I'm just gonna be sticking with my favorite approach, simply, uh, well, kind of getting like a Scandinavian uh, sort of vibe. But, there's a big but. This is an improved version because notice how, unlike in the Scandinavian, okay, this is Scandinavian, by the way, uh, for those of you that don't know, white can uh, develop like this and attack your queen. But because there's like a damn pawn on c3, that is no longer an option. So he plays d4. I am just gonna go for the fianchiaro g6 bishop g7. There are many playable setups like 96 bishop f5, 96 bishop g4. Even the let's say takes and e5 could work if you like very concrete stuff. But for somebody uh, that is just looking for a simplified way to learn the Sicilian, I think it makes a lot of sense to just stick with the fianchiaro in general. Important though. We are delaying knight to c6 move uh, because that could get you in trouble if you're not careful and white pushes. Uh, this can get nasty. So I'm going to go bishop g7. Now he can either play bishop e3 or knight a3 or bishop e2. Okay. My opponent is going for pretty mainline stuff. Here, the best move is to go cd4. Uh simply because you kind of have to play that at some point and he can no longer like get in the knight on c3 tempo but i don't think this was the most precise move here white has a trick which i'm sure my uh, which i'm uh, actually uh, sure my opponent uh, probably seen at some point but he just uh, couldn't remember it's here they're supposed to go bishop c4 that's a nice justification for knight uh, a3, you know, apart from the other alternative, knight b5 was playable as well, where I would have uh, gone knight a6, followed by knight f6 castle. I already had a few games like this uh, against the Grandmaster online, and 
Uh, Blackie just doing fine. So their tricky line is to go bishop c4. Sorry if I'm trying to, I mean, if I'm dragging the answer too much. I just uh, wanted to give you full context. You want to play queen e4. And then the point for white is to go bishop b3. Because after pawn takes, that's a huge blunder. There is bishop takes on f7. And you have no way to avoid this kind of uh, fork coming with a knight on g5. And white wins. Therefore, uh, instead of going uh, for uh, d takes on e3, on that, you're supposed to just play knight h6. Uh, and the theory goes on for a bit, but uh, black is fine. So, yeah, because he just plays cd4, I guess we're just going to be playing normal. I'm going to castle... Whatever your queen is attacked, you can go all the way back home. I know perhaps that may be a little bit strange for some of you watching. Like, uh, how does this make any sense? You're like, develop your queen, take that pawn onto d5. But then you just go all the way back home? Dude, this is pretty weird. Well, I get that. But you have to kind of realize that uh, this maneuver has accomplished uh, a great deal just because we have managed to create an isolated pawn for our opponent. And as a matter of fact, the Fianchero structure is one of the best setups that you can play uh, against the... Uh, against the IQP, against the isolated pawn. Because the bishop's directly staring into the pawn, like putting pressure. And also, they're going to have a much harder time getting to your king, just because uh, we pretty much have a nice little fortress here for the king. Uh, and on bishop to f4, there's just a cheap trick threatening to do this. You have simple move knight e6, but also you have improved move knight d5. Attacking and defending, just look at this. Multi-purpose move. Look at you, you're learning so fast. And ready to castle, knight e6. Uh, bishop wants to go to g4 in this position, just... Uh, trying to eliminate the main defender of the pawn. And we're putting pressure here. We will be able to get rid of this knight with a6. So that is not an issue. Generally, you can get rid of it immediately. However, since the knight is really not doing much. Like this is covered. I think we can just let it there uh, for a bit. The only question is whether I feel like this could be annoying. Trying to eliminate the defender and then infiltrating. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that makes some sense for my opponent, so I'm just going to go a6 right away. I want to make sure uh, we don't have to worry about any potential shenanigans anymore. <laughs> my opponent doubles down on the idea. <laughs> that is pretty funny. That's like a very good uh, example of a player that is in love with cheap tricks, but uh, that's all there is. Uh, if I take, <laughs> he wants the rook. I get that. But what if I castle? Or what if I play 96? It's like his move is completely useless. Uh, is it though? Oh, I'm pretty sure it is. So I'm just going to castle. And I'm setting up a huge trap. Like, I cannot take immediately. But I can play knight b6. This, attacking the queen, defending the rook, and then we can take. So, important I cannot do that uh, to begin with, because he would have uh, been able to double-check me, and I guess that was pretty scary. And on rook c1, he's just pretty much going all in on this idea, but I think he just uh, fails for this trick. And then he can uh, win a piece. I don't know. It looks a little bit messy still. Uh... I'm inclined to think that we're going to be winning a piece. Yeah, no, I mean, especially after queen a3, allowing me to uh, take that with a tempo. That is obviously very nice. But yeah, maybe he could have defended better, like going back uh, all the way. And when we take the knight, potentially bishop c7, regaining the piece. I mean, at the very least, <laughs> there is a queen d7 or d5 type of move, rook a2 coming, knight c6, black should be at least slightly better. Now, uh, when you're having the full extra piece, this is completely winning. Just going to keep uh, developing while gaining time. Targeting the queen. Giving up on the pawn on b5 just because uh, we didn't really have any way to uh, keep it. And uh, trying to, yet again, develop. This pawn is on fire. Maybe rook a5 could trap his queen in some lines. Like, imagine he blunders with bishop d3. 
But Rook A5 looks like genuinely trapping uh, <laughs> that Kavin. It's not every day that you see the Queen trapped like that. Even more satisfying against the Alapin players. So, um, yeah. By the way, guys, if you're wondering, uh, okay, okay, I mean, I saw many uh, strong players recommend the Alapin. Why is this uh, weird guy with a funny accent trash talking my beautiful opening? Well, I think Alapin is great, especially as a surprise uh, weapon. But generally, when your opponent knows you're playing the uh, the Alapin, it's pretty easy to neutralize. So, if you're looking for a long-term weapon against the Sicilian, um, I think Alapin it's pretty predictable. It's like sure, solid. If you need to make a draw, it's like amazing. But if you wanna keep, uh, yeah, let's say a complex game and uh, try to outplay your opponent uh, because you let's say just know the positions better, I would recommend you maybe look into the close Sicilian. I think it's better long term than the Alapin. But yet again, nothing wrong with the opening in itself. It's just that um, I find it uh, quite predictable uh, after you have a few games with it. So there is that. Hopefully we clarified uh, my thoughts on it. Uh, okay, rook to a5. The queen has to go. Another kind of problem that you have with the Alapin is that black has so many ways of playing it and they can get like a playable position. While when you're doing something like close Sicilian, your moves are like always the same, uh, pretty much. And you get a dangerous uh, attack, even if you face, let's say, the best prepared opponent, uh, which is pretty absurd if you ask me. Okay, queen d3, I am just going to be taking this free pawn. I can also play the move knight before. It's pretty much uh, yeah, a matter of personal preference, I guess. Uh, we are having the extra piece and my opponent is not developed. So this is definitely looking uh, very promising. Probably <laughs> the best Alapin game that I ever had. But... Uh, it obviously helped uh, because he blundered, but it obviously uh, also backfired because he played bishop f4. Kind of hoping for cheap tricks and uh, you just uh, saw how to give these type of players a cold shower when they are just uh, obsessed and in love with uh, cheap tricks. Yeah, now he thinks uh, we got tricked. Well, first of all, I got a check. That's almost mating. Second of all, I got knight c3 defending and forking him. So... That's it again. I guess a pretty unpleasant move to deal with for my opponent. He's going to go like queen to d3, I would assume, targeting the knight, but uh, I'm going to be up like a full rook. I don't even have to take. I could consider knight b4. I could consider queen a5, trying to play for uh, the mate, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think I like just taking, keeping it simple. And now I think uh, sliding the queen over is just GG. You can pause the video and try to find uh, what my next move is going to be. Because I think uh, we can cash in pretty big. All right. There's going to be rook a1. Taking advantage of this little uh, triangulation over there. Um, that's not really <laughs> what you call triangulation in chess, to be honest, but... Uh, I just uh, thought it was a good example here. And, yeah, I mean, I was eyeballing this move, to be honest. Just because he was completely tied down. And uh, I would have forced him to, uh, yeah, just give up the queen for a bishop. But he resigned just because uh, every single one of his pieces would have gotten picked up. So, uh, yeah, that was a pretty nice uh, effortless win onto the Alapin. And uh, just remember... Go for the Fianchero castle. Go back with the queen home all the way. Bishop f4 was a little bit uncalled for. He could have played, uh, let's say, bishop e2, castle, bishop e3. I mean, get rid of his knight, do something like this, bishop g4. Rook c8, always mid h3 with takes. And black is, um, yeah, very solid in these type of positions. Uh, I think it's easier to play since white does not have an obvious way to attack our fortress and uh, pretty much as a game plan, you generally just want to trade pieces and uh, end up 
uh, putting pressure in the uh, end games onto that uh, isolated pawn. So, with that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. All right, boys and girls, back with another game. Gonna be going for the spicy Sicilian and uh, gonna be going for uh, our beloved uh, accelerated dragon. And all right, my opponent is playing the Marochi. Now, <clears throat> this move order specifically for the Marochi is pretty inaccurate. And uh, it will actually fully become a Marochi when my opponent plays d4. However, the way this kind of looks like, he may never play uh, the move d4. Just because he won't be able to, uh, simply due to the move order, <laughs> let's say inaccurate move order that was used. Uh, because... I can play now g6, which is something we would have done uh, regardless as an accelerated dragon player. <clears throat> and notice that we'll have way too much control over that square to the point where he cannot really push d4 without losing a pawn. So, for this reason, black is very comfortable and uh, normally, in order uh, to have a more standard marot, see, let's say you can think of it as uh, let's take uh, off the board these pawns. Um, that is definitely something that we will uh, have quite a lot on the channel since it's one of the big ways for why to deal with the accelerated dragon but as for now even around like 1800 they still have very inaccurate openings as you can see <clears throat> now the thing with the knight on g3 is that uh, it is uh, first of all restricted by my pawn and second of all, it can also be harassed by potential move like this. So whenever you see like a knight on that specific square, say it's g3, g6, or this, always look for ways to uh, harass them using your rook pawn. Yeah, no matter what color you play. So this is very important, generally speaking. Now I think I'm just going to play d6. Uh, you'll hear me a lot in the accelerated dragon uh, talk about playing d5 right away. But when he has so much power over d5, that's not really going to be an option. So I'm just going to start with d6. And uh, we pretty much have to decide uh, where to develop our kingside uh, knight. I could also play h5 if I want to begin with that. I could play the standard knight f6. I could also consider e6, knight e7, with idea to put my knight on d4 and then bring the other knight supporting it. So that's also very interesting. Uh, since we don't really have a great square for the bishop on this diagonal, uh, it looks quite uh, interesting to just uh, play e6. And go for knight e7, castle. I don't really think we even have to push h5. Just, uh, yeah, simply because the knight is kind of pointless anyways. And um, we're going to go uh, knight e7 with the idea to castle. And if f4 is getting played, uh, we will uh, have to consider playing f5 ourselves. That would be the main thing. White is going to do this and try to push for f5. There is pretty much no other uh, lucrative plan in the possession. So to speak, I mean, I can still uh, consider going h5. To be honest, the more I'm looking at it, uh, including h5 and h4 is probably to our benefit, just because, uh, yeah, the g4 square is going to be uh, vulnerable, the knight is going to be a bit loose. But uh, yeah, on the other hand, just playing knight d4. Imagine we can even do that right now. Um, I just think we'll never have to worry about uh, f5, seriously speaking. And uh, because we don't have to worry uh, of f5 too much, this will give us uh, just a free hand uh, on the queen side. Because, okay, we figured out how to get a safe king. We're going to, let's say, get castle. But how do we play this out for a win? Uh, well, we're going to be doing something very uh, typical for the Sicilian in general. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm referring to the queen side play. So bishop e3, I'm not uh, afraid of this move just because uh, I can uh, take back with the bishop. If I had to take back with the pawn, I wouldn't be a huge fan of that. I want to keep this uh, eternal uh, strong point on d4. Mm. 
<clears throat> with a risk of maybe boring you to death, I want to explain that. This is just like such an insane square. It is a week since uh, these pawns have been pushed early. They can never kick out our knight. And usually you can just win games by having such a well-placed knight. It is simply that important. So you have to do your best to constantly have a piece there. I'm considering knight c6. I just uh, need to check is f5 a problem. I mean, we can win a free pawn. So I'm just going to do knight c6 with the idea to constantly be able to recapture back uh, with a knight. And next, the queenside play will be generated with a6, rook b8, and then b5. So we make sure our king is safe. Then we just have risk free pressure. Thanks to the dominant uh, knight on d4. Black is already uh, solidly better. Generally, uh, you should really consider f5 in these positions. Like whenever your opponent can uh, go f5, you should try to go f5 yourself as a rule. But just because of how weird this position is, uh, normally you'd meet uh, ef with gf. But since he has the knight there that could jump to h5 harassing the bishop, that makes me uh, kind of second guess it. So for this reason, uh, I think we don't need f5 here because it's kind of uh, covered regardless. But generally, it's just best not to allow it. So keep that idea in mind. I'm just going to continue with the queenside thing. <coughs> a6, b5, and even if he goes like a4, I don't think it's going to be enough for him to stop it. So he's really lining up his pieces. He's probably preparing uh, something like this, which, uh, yeah, cannot really blame him for. Now, considering how much power he's trying to do, like bringing the rook and then f5, it could be wise to maybe go queen h4 with idea to play f5 and uh, try to make knight h5 less effective in that variation. I don't really see how it works and I may only get my queen trapped after something like f5, so perhaps better not to do that. Hmm. <coughs> yep, I think uh, I'm just gonna go for... Uh, rook to b8 and... Uh, he will probably go rook f1 and we go b5. Okay, never mind. He plays uh, a4. He was trying to play prophylactic just because we are threatening uh, to go b5. Now, you pause the video and uh, try to find why a4 can backfire immediately. Uh, because the amazing knight from d4 is going to hit my opponent pretty hard in the face. At the knight b3, simply pick up the exchange. Honestly, he kind of panicked here. a4 was just uh, <laughs> uh, so much of a comfortable move for him, but uh, he wasn't really good. So, um, yeah, you don't have to play a4 because it's not like when I play b5, we're like winning immediately. No, it will require still uh, some actual play. So, uh, yeah, now. This is just uh, really bad for him. I'm going to pick up the rook. And what's even nicer for this is that we have another knight uh, to come into d4. We have huge threat, knight c2, and then knight takes on e3. Winning more material. And if he takes, we take with a bishop, and then we win the second rook. So this just almost uh, doesn't feel uh, fair. Like, look at this. Knight c2, <laughs> targeting the bishop, and I feel like he's going to drop even more material. Uh Simply by understanding this concept of uh, the d4 square being vulnerable. And as long as you make sure you will always have the uh, capacity of controlling it with a piece. So it's not like you commit your pawn for such a beautiful square. It would just uh, be a waste. Imagine you're having like a, a very nice uh, apartment in the middle of the city, but nobody is living there. Like you're not even renting it. So... Uh, that is just uh, a big waste. I mean, to be honest, <laughs> based on uh, how uh, people, especially in Romania, may treat the renting places, it might be smart not to rent it, but uh, that's a different topic. We don't have to get into that. I'm going to go bishop to d4, just uh, lining up the pressure, and then I'm going to go b5. 
can I go B5? I can also go F5 saying that we're completely shutting down uh, like this four pieces. Because if he plays F5, maybe some interesting play, but I want to show you guys uh, the power of the uh, B8 rook. Because F5, I don't think it's even that big uh, of a threat because allows queen G5. Uh, this is just like uh, such a nice... Uh, <clears throat> and solid position it feels like we're never really under uh, any uh, pressure and uh, sort of uh, the uh, let's say aggressive play is a little bit more intuitive compared to the Karokan let's say <clears throat> Karokan is very good it's just that uh, it is very good to become super solid okay the tricky part uh, in the Karokan is uh, when you actually have to play it for a win and Let's say you try to uh, squeeze a bit of uh, water out of stone. So um, that is the only kind of difficult uh, part. Now, the Sicilian in general is uh, way more intuitive when it comes to how to play it for a win, which is the nice side of it. The downside of it uh, is that uh, sometimes you can get mated. So unless you're into that, uh, these are like the pros and cons. Okay, so he wants to do f5 and perhaps activate a little. I would love to infiltrate uh, with the queen. But notice that queen a5, f5 may be a little bit annoying. I'm saying maybe because I'm not sure. Still, I would love to infiltrate, but then taking, I mean, we just take with a pawn. So, yeah, I don't know. He could do knight g4. But it really feels like this shouldn't be a problem. On the other hand, I don't want to give him any activity whatsoever. So I think f5 is really a nice move. Just literally wasting this bouquet of pieces. Do you see that? f5 is such an insane move. And don't do this because then he can activate the bouquet of pieces. But do this. Because on like knight d5, we can easily play bishop b7. And uh, now the bishop activates. <clears throat> The rook also has much more intuitive path into the game. And uh, yeah, this is just uh, so comfortable and uh, easy to play. Bishop to b7. I could do rook e8. Uh, any move should be good. I guess we'll just try to immediately uh, <coughs> take care of this. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I just feel like there is something stuck in my throat. Almost like this uh, knight was uh, stuck in my opponent's throat uh, during the whole game. I know that's a bishop technically, but uh, for the most part, it was a knight, if you remember. So, uh, yeah, I want to do this. I want to do rook e8. He is genuinely not having any active prospects. It is just a very sad position for my opponent to be in. And therefore, he resigns. Okay, fair enough. All right, guys, I just uh, ran the game review. Apparently, we go like a 95, but did it really feel to you like we had to make any special moves? I mean, uh, to me, everything just seemed very simple. You get this nice, typical development. Just take a mental screenshot uh, of this uh, setup. That's pretty much a universal way to deal with any anti-Sicilian except the Alapin. That's like a little bit different and we'll go over that. But uh, yeah, any other anti-Sicilian, you can do this. Go castle, a6, rook b8, b5. You're going to be doing just fine. Before I let you go, I just wanted to say a very sincere thank you. We almost made 500 subs onto the uh, second channel that I have just made. The plan with this channel is to have, uh, let's say, uh, smaller videos around, uh, let's say, the 10 to 15 minutes mark that are perhaps a little bit easier to watch. Uh, we could maybe experiment more uh, there. And uh, already a lot of you subscribed, which is honestly insane. I cannot thank you enough. This is probably more than uh, I did in uh, my first uh, year on YouTube. So uh, we'll be posting uh, something there pretty soon. I've got... Uh, some uh, interesting ideas. I already have uh, some uh, cool matches against some other popular streamers. So if you haven't checked it already, uh, you can use the link from the description because uh, I don't think the channel will uh, appear yet. And uh, I cannot thank you enough. Yet again, thank you guys for watching and uh, 
I'll see you around. Have a good one.